You're listening to Barbell Logic, the podcast where we talk about what it means to experience strength and how you can use simple, hard, and effective strategies in training and nutrition to improve your life. It starts with meeting you where you are right now and finding lasting solutions. Welcome to the show. Hey, everybody. It's Matt and Nikki at the Barbell Logic Podcast. <laughs> hey, thanks for stopping by. <laughs> <laughs> in full color and HD on Riverside <laughs> FM. We're trying this again for the video podcast listeners. Uh, welcome to the Barbell Logic Podcast. We're going to talk about autoregulation today. We, I had led with this uh, last week. Jordan Stanton, we had Jordan Stanton did a great talk for the at the Block Conference for our coaches about velocity-based training and the way he utilizes really the Rep1 device and velocity-based training as a type of autoregulation uh, a way to program autoregulation. And the goal originally was for this podcast to be the first podcast in that series. You and I had scheduling conflicts last week, and so we're doing it this week. So this is second. So we're really going to try to get it, give a good overview, like 30,000 foot view of autoregulation and what that is. And then that help will help give some context and some coloring to what Jordan did. And then we'll, uh, I think we're going to do in a upcoming episode in the next couple of weeks, we're going to do a little bit of a Q&A and talk a little bit more about what autoregulation is and how to utilize velocity-based training. If you don't have velocity-based training, what can you do uh, to kind of make up for it? So cool. let me start with this. <clears throat> autoregulation may be a new term for a lot of people. And so autoregulation is really just a way to adjust primarily the intensity or really the stress in general of a specific workout on a specific day for a specific time based on the ability of that lifter that day. And so we all, it really, what it does is, is, and if you've listened to this podcast for years, we've talked about the stress recovery adaptation cycle. That's a very extremely general cycle of what occurs, an explanation of what occurs in strength training, as well as other stresses in your life, right? You stress, you stress your body in a way that it really hadn't been stressed before. It can't be too much or it will kill you as on cell you figured out if it's just right like the porridge for goldilocks then it will elicit the adaptive response that it needs if it's not enough you won't adapt you won't get any better we have we have um gone a bit deeper with that in the in the dual factor theory the stress um the stress and fatigue sort of the fitness and fatigue theory laid out in um in science and practice of strength training by uh, Vladimir Zatsiorsky, Scott and I talked about that a few years ago and talking about that really there's this constant, there's this constant balance that's being played in programming and training between the amount of fitness that you get or adaptation that you get or positive responses that you get from training and the negative responses that you get. Obviously, when we go into the gym, we beat ourselves up, there's sort of some sort of amount of micro trauma to the muscles, we are sore, we are tired, we're fatigued or whatever. And maintaining the correct balance is the thing that actually elicits the adaptation, adaptive responses. And so if we if we dive even a little bit deeper in this autoregulation, the idea here is how do we make sure that we are bringing about the right amount of stress in every single workout of every single day? And I'll start by saying in as a novice, it's just like not necessary because at least that's my opinion, and I'm happy to hear yours as well. Like we're, I'm just going to add five pounds to the bar for as long as I can. And again, coming back to some of those MED principles Scott and I talked about, we're going to choose intensity over volume in general for as long as we can. We're going to keep driving up the weight of the bar. We're going to drive up the weight of the bar, drive up the weight of the bar, drive up the weight of the bar until we can't do that anymore, and then we have to make a change. And so since that is the case, then I don't actually care if the lifter is not fully recovered or better recovered than normal, or like, I just care, can, can they put five more pounds on the bar or a little more weight increase on the bar and do the sets and reps and do that again 48 hours from now? So let's start there. How much have you played with this autoregulation and then how do you view it from a novice standpoint or when would you start to give it consideration for your clients? Um, in the novice arena, the cool thing about coaching a novice and being a novice is that you can be pretty dang sure that if you go up five pounds to 10 pounds seems to be the range for most people in most lifts, you're pretty dang sure that you can do it. And it's kind of more of 
overriding like the emotional components of I'm not sure, like being a little scared of the weight, which is totally natural and being able to rely on you having way more in the tank to perform better based off of um, how you're training your muscles now yeah. kind of, and the neuromuscular adaptation we're creating. And then when you get more advanced, like really towards the later stage, you're really just like squeezing out the, wringing out the towel of how much you can get out of the your physical capacity that day. Yeah, <laughs> like, that's right. Um, and so you have a lot to wring out as a novice. So you can really just kind of be like, for sure, like put your feelings aside today, put your fear aside. I believe in you. You got this. But when you get more advanced, it's like the the for sure turns into a hopefully, maybe, possibly. <laughs> and so like you have to kind of be less or you you are less certain about what you're working with that day in terms of the human specimen. And so you have to be able to modify the program and the numbers to work with what that human is capable of doing that day. And I think that's where this becomes really useful is because you can't run them into the ground because that's totally possible sure. where, you know, it looks wonderful on paper, but then when someone has to do it, they just kind of maybe repeatedly get beat up and beat up and beat up. That's right. Or it's not enough. Yeah. We, you know, we've said this before. We, we can have some amount of control as coaches over the productive stress in a client's life, right? The specifically the productive stress that leads to strength increases or physical change. But we have no control or very little control over the unproductive stress. As a matter of fact, one of the things I think that maybe it's a good pitch for our nutrition program, I think having a good nutrition coach is something that, you know, nutrition is is there all the time, like 24 hours a day, seven days a week on days that you train and days that you don't. And so having a good nutrition coach is great because they can, they can it's that next step in helping to regulate the amount of stress, right? And the amount of recovery and Hey, you're a little beat up. You're beat up right now. Let's let's bump up your calories by three or four hundred calories a day. Or hey, you're 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 not, and you're putting on weight, and you're seeing uh, the inches of your waist grow, which means that they're probably too many calories. And so we, they can help kind of hone in on the stress from a nutrition like standpoint. On the fuel, yeah, that's right. And we can do the same thing in the weight room. But what we can't do is we can't have any control, and often we don't have great knowledge about. And certainly, this comes back to the relationship you build between a coach and a client of life stress, home stress, work stress, family stress, money stress, all those things. And those things, sleep, or just like the lack of sleep, or how was your, like I, the first thing, I don't know if you still do this, the literally the first thing I do in the morning, when I get up, I get up, TMI, I don't have contacts on, so I gotta go sit down on the toilet because I can't stand up because <laughs> it would be a disaster. So I have to sit down because I never, I would never, I don't know if I could see the toilet. I've got to feel the toilet like a blind really person. Really busy day for the house cleaners. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Sit down on the toilet, but I can see up close. So while I'm having my morning pee, <laughs> 40 <laughs> seconds after waking up, I look at my auto sleep and I look at what my sleep score was. I got over yeah. three hours last night. I crushed Holy it. Holy moly. That's awesome. I have been, here's a weird thing. I've been nice going job. right into deep sleep upon falling asleep. Oh. which is not normal for me. Normally it's like, right. It kind of like trails down. And so, yeah, I don't know what's been the thing, but I've just been passing out at night. Like it's eight 30, like eight 37. I'm in deep sleep. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how, how it happens. <laughs> anyway. Great. So we don't have a lot of control over those things as a coach. And, you know, there are perfect scenarios where you have great relationships with your clients. Your clients are very transparent and honest with a coach. You've coached them for a long time. You've built that relationship. That's a lot of what ifs. There's a lot of times like things are going on in the client's life and they're just not going to tell you because you haven't coached them that long or they're just not that way and they're not going to be like, hey, I was up fighting with my wife all night last night or whatever. I'm super stressed about finances. We're in the middle of a recession and they just, they're, they're, that, that takes some amount of not just transparency, but vulnerability, it's sort of swallowing your pride. And that's not going to happen some. And so we can do the best we can as a coach to try to program on a weekly basis or even a sub, you know, a multiple couple times a week basis, you're kind of relooking at your client's training and adjusting programming on the fly a little bit for the next couple of workouts. But that's ultimately just based on your coach's eye of what you're seeing them do in the weight room at the time. Yeah. Yeah. Then that's, that can be tricky. Like you were saying is sometimes you don't know until all of a sudden they have the week from hell right. and they miss like, ton of reps like they usually don't miss reps and then 
all of a sudden the reps just ghost them. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> and I think it takes, um, I admittedly, I run into that pretty frequently with clients who I've been working with for, I don't know, fewer than six months or something. Yep. And then it takes a couple of cycles for me to be like, ah, okay, I have pushed this person too far. Yeah, I'm yeah, so yeah. sorry. <laughs> yeah. And sometimes you don't know till, and they, they might not know either. They're just like, I'm just doing the work. And then they can't do the work one day. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Just all piles yeah, up. On I've them. had some clients lately that I've got a three or four clients that are kind of my version of the five, three, one. So they're, they're on a five on a three week cycle. And a couple of them are starting to hit the wall and they're like, is everything okay? And I'm like, it's great. It's perfect. Thing. This, this is what tells us yep. it's time to make the next change. Yeah. Totally fine. You hit your, th yeah. you know, you hit your fives and then you struggle with your threes and then maybe you missed your singles. Um, you know, three out of four singles or two out of four singles. And they're like, hey, that's not on you. That's on me. It's just like, okay. It's now you need that, something different now. You are a different That's time to make the next now. change. That's exactly right, right? And so yeah. <laughs> what auto-regulation does is it allows you to, to regulate that stress and have a little bit of flex in the workout for intermediates maybe and advanced definitely in the midst of the training so that you get the right dose of stress for each session to make sure that... The, if the right dose of stress is, again, we're going to use as a communication term, say an RP eight and a half, and what you're prescribing them is going to be much higher than that. It's going to be a nine and a half or a 10, then they can back off the weight a little bit. And if what you've prescribed them is, this is the other thing, is that, you know, the old, the famous uh, Kurt Karwaski thousand three squat for a double during training two weeks out from a meet, he was like, it was there, I had to take it. And then he didn't have as great of a meet. And a lot of people would be like, well, maybe you shouldn't take it. Like he probably would have never yeah. got that again. And so yeah. <laughs> for a novice, one of my biggest complaints is when I program something for novice and they're like, you know, I just felt like I could do 20 pounds more. So I just put 20 more pounds on the bar. I'm like, oh, you just screwed the whole program up. <laughs> yeah. But for an advanced lifter, it's completely different. If it's like, hey, you felt great. It was there for the taking. Yeah. The 20 pound increase was there. You might not get it again, or you might not get it for another six months. Go, that's fine. But likewise, if you're in there and you're prescribed to do X amount of weight, and there's that flex built in with auto regulation, we'll get to how do we how do we do that here in a minute. And that's not there. It's going to be an absolute grinder. It's going to grind them into powder. They have the same flex to be able to take some of that weight off the bar, and that's that's the goal. Do you want to describe or explain like the you just said RP eight point five and nine point five a minute ago? Do you want to? review what the scale is? Sure, sure. So I didn't come up with RP. So it's ratings of perceived exertion. So they're, 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 here are the methods that we can use for auto-regulation. So as we, we're we looking for the inputs from something, often people, to tell us how stressful was it. That's really what we're trying to do, right? And so very similar is RPE, which is rating of perceived exertion, which really goes a scale from, it's a scale from one to 10. You almost throw out the first five, maybe in the first yeah, six, six is like six, a very yeah. much of a deload. Seven would be the first thing that I'd call training. Seven means there's typically, you did it, you you could have, you had five to four to five reps left in the tank. The yeah, RP seven. You could have added more weight and you could have added more reps. That's right. Whole, RP yeah. eight is going to be, you got about two to three reps left in the tank. An RP nine is really heavy. Maybe you had one more rep. An RP 10 is an all out. You had no chance to get another rep or you missed. Yeah. Right. A miss is an RP 10. Yeah. And so that's RP. The other one that bodybuilders tend to use, and I hear Renaissance use it quite a bit, and I, I like some of the stuff that those guys do, is reps in reserve. It tends to be more towards the hypertrophy side. And, and the goal there is that most of the studies have shown that to elicit uh, maximum hypertrophy, we want to have less than five reps in reserve. So but most of those guys are doing sets in the eight to 10 to 12 to 15 12. range, right? So it's like you do it almost to an AMRAP. So it's like an AMRAP, but you leave a few reps in the tank, but you definitely leave five or less reps in the tank to really get yeah. that hypertrophy response. Yeah. That's I idea. think that's important in that realm because it's kind of easy to be able, air quotes around easy, to do sets of 20 of some of these exercises. And you need to make sure you're not doing the weights that you could do sets of 20 of. You need to ensure that you're doing weights that keep you around sets That's right. of 8 to 12. Yeah, and we used so, to, in the early yeah. programming argument days, 
where we were getting into it with others on the internet, there was this argument about like, I, I in retrospect, I look back and I say like, ah, we probably aren't that far away from, from what we think about things. There is a threshold, a minimum threshold, I think for intensity specifically for the load on the bar. Um, so l- let me use an example. So let's say you're like, hey, I'm going to do for hypertrophy, make sure all my sets are less than five reps in reserve. And I'm going to do push-ups. And I get 52. And I have less than five reps left in reserve. How much of a hypertrophy or certainly strength response is that going to give me? Almost Not no. much. Yeah, <laughs> that's a real good endurance day. <laughs> that's right. And so and so it there is a threshold that you go like, well, it's got to be heavy-ish enough. And where is that percentage? I don't know, but I, I certainly would argue that it's in the 80s. It's a, it's they're probably around 80, low 80s, somewhere there, yeah. 80% range. And not to say that some people can't, you can't, for strength, for strength, and for, and probably 70% or 65% for hypertrophy. And it's hard to, you know, you can't just go like, hey, I'm going to do 25% for sets of 80, 75 reps. And leave five reps in the tank and get it's just at some point there's a minimum threshold and also who wants (laughs) to do that that sounds terrible so the downside with using rpe or reps in reserve for auto regulation is it's a completely subjective input by the trainee only nobody ever talks about this but rpe wasn't really a thing until there was online coaching and specifically online programming right and actually i was thinking about this before the I think a couple days ago, as I was thinking about the show. Um, okay. So have you ever used RPE for an in-person client when you're standing there coaching them? Um, kind of like in an educational sense of, I won't say like, all right, we're going to do reps until you hit RPE eight. And you just, right. you just stop when you hit eight. <laughs> like, so how no, do you not it? that way. It's like, you, you might like, go like, go ahead. Um, I'll, I will, in my head, be like, I want them to end up at an RPE 8. And so I will kind of use that to kind of guide the weight selection, or I'll tell them to stop doing reps in a set. Yep. But be like, all right, that's less good often will I say like, all right, let's make this a set of 8, and then, I'll just, then they'll just go until they decide. That's not super frequent. <laughs> yeah, I don't know that I've ever done that. And there yeah, are times when I do that, I both in online coaching and in person, where I'm like, okay, how hard was that? How many reps did you have left in the tank? Right. And I'll go one and I go, mm-hmm. nope, you had three. Yeah. And they'll be like, I had three? And I'm like, yep, you had three. All right. So stop for a second. This is really important. Because if you, all you all you do is online programming and you don't see the lift as a coach, you get one subjective input with RPE or reps in reserve, and it's the clients. And it's their subjective input of how hard it felt while the bar was on their back or in their hands. And it's that's hard. It's actually hard to judge yeah. yourself on how what the RP was. It takes some time for sure. You've yeah. got to really kind of curate that and talk through your clients and mentor. There are times when I use RPE when I when I introduce a new exercise in online coaching. So okay, somebody's going to do a rack pull for the first time ever. So you're going to do four sets of three at RP seven or eight, right? So you're going to leave whatever whatever I just say it's eight. I want you to leave two to three reps in the tank on all the sets. And then later I get to watch because I'm watching their videos and I know their bar speed and I know how hard it is. And I make sure that we're on the same page and often we're not quite, but we're within one of, and so I always then will respond to them and say, Hey, that wasn't an RP eight. That was actually an RP seven or that wasn't an RP eight. That was an RP nine, a little harder than it should have been. And that's okay. All I'm looking for is, and I always put this in the notes because I want the clients to know that that I'm not being lazy, is you help me find the starting weight on this exercise and I'll program the weight from here on out. And that's if we're able to use RPE reps and reserve, right? So, but the doubt, and so I would argue, one, the major downside of RPE and reps and reserve is that you get first one subjective input from the client. And at most, two subjective inputs, one from the client, one from the coach. And I would argue that two subjective inputs are better than one because you can say like, well, the coach saw it as an RPE 8, the client saw it as an RPE 9, whatever. And so you can say, okay, we can kind of, we can kind of hone in on this and we can make some adjustments. But the downside is in real time, 
the client has to make the adjustment on the fly. If it's an RPE this, and then back offsets with 10% less, you just have to trust that they have a pretty good handle of RPE. So we often use RPE, we've talked about this on the podcast a lot, as communication tool, and less as an auto-regulation tool. I think it's still appropriate and can be done with certain people. I don't want to say it's never worthwhile, but I think it's got some serious um, downfalls. Yeah, it works well, like you were saying earlier, with hypertrophy work. If I'm giving someone curls, I need them to hit a 9 or 10. Yeah. If I'm giving them tricep work, they got to get to a 9 or a 10. Yep. Or isolation exercises, they got to get up there. But the the amount of thoughts that come into play when you're deciding what the RPE was for a set can be a lot. For sure. <laughs> like they're, and that, that's why I think it's really hard when a client is just blindly going for like four by three at RP eight week after week after week is because they're, they're kind of bl- flying blind each time, which is why I think it's nice to have a coach to be like, oh yeah, you were spot on on that one or no, yep. you weren't. Because the coach, I think, has an arguably more objective opinion. Whereas the lifter is going to think, was that heavy enough? Could I have done more? Should I have done more? Sure. Like, I really want to be able to hit 315. So I'm going to do everything I can to hit 315. And that kind of overrides the prescription of the RPE. That's right. Or they might be just having a, a crappy day and like everything is an RPE 10. Yep. And so they're fighting the the thought battle upstairs. And the and the feels. And those are really kind of distracting and those can really impact the the RP rating that you have. Like you can decide that, you know, if you don't get this and if this is an RPE 10, then everything's a waste. Like you just right. have all these thoughts up here. That's but right. then you, the coach, you get to be like thinking, you get in your head to imagine all the squats that you've seen them do up to that point yep. and be like, oh no, you're good. Yep, You're at an eight. Yeah, awesome I, don't, I don't have the feels. I mean, I literally <laughs> right. don't have the feeling of the bar on my back because I didn't squat yeah. that weight. So I just have my eyes and I've seen thousands and thousands and thousands of reps. And I can say, hey, you're fine. Look, I know you, I know it felt, I mean, how many times have you said this to a client? Because I've said it a bunch. I know you said it felt really, really heavy, but watch the speed. Like, yeah. and remove yourself emotionally from the lift and just look, just watch this video right now. Yeah. Look, that's moving pretty good. And yeah. they're like, I guess you're right. I guess it wasn't that heavy. Like, yeah, it just yeah. felt heavy. Like, that's okay. Sometimes it just feels really heavy. Right. Didn't feel heavy to me. I didn't lift it. I'm the coach. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, in, I'm across the country. <laughs> that's right. I had, I was thinking about this too. And I was, I've been bringing my dog to the park. And anybody who has a dog knows that dogs at the park are always going to be at RPE 10. They will always <laughs> be at RPE 10. They're full bore. Full bore. And he'll do it if he's if he's hurt, if he's exhausted. I can trust it's RP10. But by the fourth day at the park, he is moving slower right. and he can't do as many runs. Right. So he's still at RP10, but the reps and the intensity is way down. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> like, That's good. As humans, we don't like we have limits like we're we are actually we feel tired and we're like, ow, I am injured. I'm not going to push that hard. Right. <laughs> so it's like, like a I'm good going. kind of comparison of how our emotions can really influence what that RP is going to be for that sure. day. For sure. Yeah. So then attached to that and leading into what you, you were talking about, especially how you prescribe this for kind of hypertrophy work, accessory work at the end of the end of the workouts is AMRAP is another way that we can yeah. auto regulate. And so. There, there is a uh, a program called the APRE. I meant to look this up. I forget what that stands for, but it's auto-regulatory something, prescription probably. Um, and the foremost authority on that is a guy by the name of Brian Mann, M-A-N-N-B-R-Y-A-N. Um, and he was a coach at Mizzou and actually was a, we got our undergrad together at Missouri State. He's at, he's at Miami now. He's one of the head strength coaches at Miami. And he's got some books on the APRE. And it's a really interesting book. And basically what you do, and it's been a long time since I've done this, but I, I did it with my advanced high school kids back in the day, is you hit kind of a top set of whatever, you know, a top set of a lift for as many reps as you can get. And it's somewhere in the ballpark of eight reps. And if you get nine or 10 reps during that first AMRAP set, then your back off sets go up 10 pounds or 5% or something. And if you only get six or seven reps for a weight that you should have hit eight on, then it drops by. So it adjusts actually instead of the main lift, it takes the or the main set, first set, 
based on your performance of the first set, then it adjusts the rest of the sets afterwards. Now, this is okay, right? So this is a little bit more objective. The downside is that you have to end up with a with an RPE 10 first set every workout, which is pretty yeah. damn stressful. And you wonder what the cost is, yeah. Right, that's right. So what's what's the, is it the risk worth the reward? And so certainly it's it's valuable. And that, interestingly enough, this guy has a lot of um, experience with the Tendo unit, which was the original velocity based piece. Because when you're at a you know big time Division One school, they can afford twenty five thousand dollars <laughs> units of things. And so um, <laughs> he actually did a, a really interesting study, I think, for his master's about um, they did power cleans for maximum force production based on the Tendo unit and tried to see what the correlation was between that and vertical jump increase. And it was interesting as guys, so rather than power cleaning up to their max weight, they power cleaned up to their max power output. Oh, wow. So the combination of weight and speed. And they, sa- they found that it had much better carryover to the vertical jump than just being able to clean the most weight, and which was interesting. And um, interesting. But anyway, so Brian puts... Some good stuff together with the AMRAP. The, again, the downside of AMRAP is, do I want my client lifting RPE 10 on every lift, on, on the first lift of each day Maybe all the time? Maybe for Louis Simmons. Yeah. yeah, it's pretty tough. Yeah. And so so there's some drawbacks there as well. And again, for you know poor man auto-regulation, it's probably okay. And I certainly think it's okay for non-compound um, movements, accessory movements. I use AMRAP a lot of times, the opposite of what the APRE does. So I know in general where a client should be for say barbell barbell curls or LTEs or something. And I say on the last set, go to AMRAP. So you're going to do three sets of 10. And a lot of times it's in a circuit or something, right? And on the last set of that, do it for as many reps as you can do it. And then based on how many reps they got it for, I have a general idea of how much to adjust the weight up or down the following week. So if it's like, well, I got it for 10, 10, and 17, and I'm like, okay, and the weight can go up. But if I got it for 10, 10, and 9, the like, yeah, weight can stay the same, <laughs> right? Or yeah. whatever. So I'll use that AMRAP a lot of times for accessory movements, but it's still, it's not yeah. super, super accurate. And I don't want to do an AMRAP on squats. Yeah, I was going to say, like, when when someone will see, like, an AMRAP, you really get to, and as a lifter, figure out what motivates you for that AMRAP. Yeah. Or when you or when you see RPE nine, you're like, am I in an RPE nine kind of mode today? Or right. like, right. is this really is as many reps as possible, or as many reps as I feel like today? Right. Right. <laughs> like that has, to, I think that has to be programmed kind of selectively because sometimes the lifter will be like, I am out of AMRAPs. Right. I'm AMRAPed out. <laughs> right. That's right. That's right. So so yes. So that's another. Some sort subjective of combination risk. between subjective and objective, right? So there's yeah. an objective piece, like if it's really an AMRAP, it's objective, but but also knowing that the client's psyche goes into it, yeah. sort of steers it into a subjective into manner, <laughs> for sure. Yeah. And then we, we already mentioned, you've got the coach's eye, judgment in the gym in the real time, and or feedback after the workout for an online coaching experience, especially if you are a coach who breaks down videos for your clients then I think that's another, it's still subjective, but it's a non-feel, non-emotional based subjective. Yeah. If you're a good professional useful. coach, you can just watch bar speed and you can have a good idea of how hard it should look for that person. And you know your lifters who are slower than normal and you know your lifters who are faster than normal and you can make some judge, judgment calls there, yeah. certainly. And then the velocity-based training tools really make it pretty objective, you said, about bar speed. I would say 100% objective. Yeah, I would say no awesome. matter how good your eye is, and I think the two of us have a very good eye. We've done this for many well tens practiced. of thousands of hours. Yeah. That a velocity-based hardware is better than our eyes. It just is. I would have to agree. It's, you know, it's, yeah. it's that, you know, a, a human is never going to beat a computer at chess ever again, ever. And yeah. at some point, we just have to recognize that so we can deny it or we can just be like, listen, this thing can measure the exact velocity of every rep. It can measure Great the tool. average velocity, can measure the peak velocity, can measure the fall off velocity, the 
all of those things. And Jordan talked about this last week. We'll talk about it more next week or in a couple weeks. And so those velocity-based training, it del- it tells you exactly. So what you do with these velocity-based training guides, and by the way, there isn't a good one that doesn't have hardware attached right now. The day will also come for sure where these phones get better and better. I've got a 13, Rachel just got a 14. She dropped her, she had her phone for like four years and she finally dropped, she's really good at never breaking her phone. She dropped it perfectly and just shattered everywhere. (laughs) And so I was like, well, it's time to do the upgrade. And the camera on that thing is just ridiculous. And it it can see depth of field. And as time goes on, we don't see depth of field and cleaner and cleaner and good uh, software and good algorithms will these you'll yeah. eventually have apps that can really legitimately measure yeah. bar speed. There are some like, that try to do it right now. I've tested them all. They're not that great. Mm. The hardware does great because you've got an actual wire. It's an attachment. That it, yep, it's down on the floor. The The product is down on the floor. The wire attaches to the barbell. That wire moves and it measures how much did it mm-hmm. move? How fast did it move? How much variance, um, horizontal variance do we get? There's all sorts of great stuff that you can pull from. And the the most important piece is that it's completely objective. And so what you do is you can take a lifter, what we do. Brett's doing this right now. I've had several of my clients do this before. Brett McKay is doing this. And the first first week sucks because what you have to do, it's like day one, let's say a squat. You hit 50% for a single, 55% for single, 60% for single, 65% for single, all the way up to 100%. So you really need 10 inputs. And the goal is to move the weight, the bar, with intention, the velocity intention every single time. So you're trying to move it as fast as you can. So 50%, but you're trying to move it as fast as you can. And then 55% as fast as you can. And it sets it sets the velocity curve for a lifter. So for somebody like, I don't know that Scott is actually slow, but we always joke that Scott was really slow and not very athletic. So if Scott did it, his velocity <laughs> curve would look different than yeah. somebody who's really athletic. The velocity curve should be, at least data has shown us, the same, the curve is the same, the slope of the line is the slain, is the same, no matter how strong or weak you are that day. So okay. even if your theoretical max goes up or down 50 pounds in a specific day, the curve will be the same or the slope of the line will be the same. And so we know how fast your 80% should be. So when you hit that number, you can go, that's my 80% for today. And then you can calculate, you can do a Estimated one rep max, which again, is just an estimated one rep max. You don't get to count it, but it's still a pretty nice objective um, algebraic equation. And you can say, oh, I'm a little stronger than normal today because I'm fast. Or I'm a little weaker than normal today because I'm slow. And you can adjust the weight based on the velocity of the barbell. And often, it's interesting, there is the psyche thing that comes into play because you're trying to move everything with intention. For me, when I'm doing this, like I'm trying to be ahead of the curve as I'm right. warming up. I'm trying to be like, yeah. I want to be faster than normal. And right. sometimes you are, and then sometimes you're like, man, I'm trying to be faster than normal, and I'm <laughs> slower than normal. It, and, it gives you that little like that like dopamine hit. Like, that's right. Oh, I did it. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> I also think there's something to be said for moving every single rep as fast as humanly possible, right? Under for perfectly real. good form. Again, that doesn't yeah. mean it's not measuring the speed of the entire rep. So like I, my negative, my my eccentric phase is not specifically fast. It's like, okay, I'm under control. But when it's time to fire, it's time to fire. Like we're going to go and we're going to try to accelerate the bar as best we can. And sometimes when it's heavy enough, you can't accelerate the bar, but we're still trying. And, it, and I think that alone recruits more motor units and more muscle fibers and can lead to better strength gains and better hypertrophy and lots of things like that. So I think those things are all really valuable. So really we end up with these four major methods for auto-regulation. One is RPE slash reps and reserve. That's the same. One is an AMRAP. Um, One is the coach's eye. And then one is velocity-based training. And really the velocity-based training is the only one that's truly objective. But takes into account, yeah, what you're bringing to the platform that day. I think that's really useful. That's exactly right. Yeah. So, yeah. Do you have any advice for a lifter who's who wants to be successful with auto regulation? Yeah, I, I think actually using as many of these as possible is actually valuable. So I th- think that the least effective method, it, while not totally ineffective, I want to be clear, I don't think it's totally ineffective, is for the client who just has a program that they're following 
that is RPE based, it's like an online program they're following, online template that they're following. And they're just trying to use RPE only. There's no, there's no real prescription for there's load no or percentages. Yeah. It's just RPE only. So when I prescribe this for my clients, whether it's velocity based, especially if it, even especially if it's velocity based, I say, okay, you're going to move. The weight is whatever four sets of three at 0.32 meters per second. That number is just depending on the lifter and the lift, and that should be about 84 percent of the lift, right? And that should put you at a basically an RPE this. So I actually try to give them all those things because the more yeah. inputs I get, the better it yep. gets. I don't remember overthinking yeah. it. I mean, that's the key. And then the nice thing about a velocity based thing is you can just look at the numbers and the numbers don't lie. But it, it, it also sometimes if I've done the velocity based training, what I do is I lift, I go as fast as I can. And I think to myself, that felt a little harder than it should have been. Or if a little easier, it felt dead on. And then I and then I look at the thing. I haven't looked at it yet. And then I look at it and go, hmm, I'm, I'm right or I'm not, right? Like, oh, I thought it was harder than it should have been, but actually the speed says it was pretty good. I'm fine to keep going up. And so as many of those inputs as I can get without overcomplicating things, it's certainly it's easy to overcomplicate, I, I want to be able to do. And so, um, you know, and I think, again, the next best step from just RPE only is RPE with two person inputs, the lifter and the coach. And I think there's some value to that, right? And I think mostly the value there is in a communication tool of how hard did you think it was and how hard do I think it is based on watching your videos and trying to come into, so you're, you're far apart. And then as you do this closer and closer, you get closer and closer into your definition of, so that you have the same yeah. definition or the same feel of RP eight or seven and a half right. or nine or whatever. So I think those things are valuable as well. I think AMRAPs are perfectly acceptable. I think I would use them extremely sparingly with the compound movements and definitely feel free to utilize them on the accessory movements, um, especially, you know, either with a top set and back offs or like I do with the last set. Hey, let's go ahead and finish this out and make sure we have real true muscle fatigue at the end. I think it's great. And then, yeah, velocity based training with a device like the Rep One. We don't have a relationship with Rep One. They've been a good company to work with. There are others on the market that are doing well. There are going to be more and more competitors over time. That Tendo unit, when it first came out, was $2,500, $3,000, something like that. And these units now are about 10% of that. So they're somewhere in that $300 range, $400 range, $500 range max. Um, so it's still not cheap. But if you're an advanced lifter, uh, it's something that is can be really interesting and, and can also add a little bit of additional motivation to what maybe feels like stagnant training after years. So that's the yeah. other thing that I really like about it is that velocity piece. I've got several clients using it now. I've had several clients ask me about it this last week after it came out on Tuesday. Jordan's talk and say, hey, Coach, do you think I'm a good candidate for that? And most of them are because they've done this for a while. And it doesn't really change that much. It doesn't change the overall program very much. It just gives them the ability to build in some flex on the daily basis to hit the right stress. And I think that's... Yeah. That's advantageous for everybody. So I like that. That's how that's how I use it. I think if I were to put a bow on it, I'd remind people that or I advise people who are using this is it's a way to make sure that what you're doing is enough to be effective without it becoming a risk. Yes. So remember when your program is to do like an RP eight. An RP eight is a real sweet spot because it is enough to drive some sort of adaptation yep. without it dipping into the risk pool. Yep. Like RP9 and 10, especially when not programmed, becomes a risk. Yep. Especially in RP10, unplanned. And especially with hypertrophy work, stuff that you would program AMRAPs, AMRAPs for, studies show that you have to get to that point for it to be worth it. Sure. So if you're going to go to the gym and do three sets of 10 on the leg extension machine, don't do three sets of 10 that you could do 20 of. It's not right. even worth your time. That's right. So the intent behind it is to make sure you're doing enough. And then it's managed by make sure you're, to make sure you're not doing too, too much. much. That's right. Yeah. That's and great. keep that in mind whenever you're weighing the cost of like, man, I really want 200 pounds to be an RPE 8. Can I make it an RPE 8? Yep. Be like, careful, because that 8 is there for a reason That's because right. of what's coming next. That's right. And so take that into account when, when you start playing that game with yourself of like, what's, I really want this. I don't feel like this today. Like when you start weighing your emotions. Yep. 
Yeah, I, I think it's also really important to understand that when you get to this point in training of auto regulation, especially vol- velocity based or RP based, all of it is that you have to take the long view. So you will have days. So remember, if we go back and fantasize about what it was like to do LP and just put five pounds on the bar every single time for four months, you're never doing that again. Like it's linear progression. Guess what training isn't ever anymore? Linear. It's just not. It's like a scatter chart, right? <laughs> right. But <laughs> overall, if you did the, you know, if you smoothed out the lines, yeah, it's still a relatively linear line, but it's, yeah. you know, it's got bumps and ridges and whatnot. And so, yeah. and so you can't let yourself get down. So, and I've done this before too, where I'm like, okay, my speed was whatever on bench press this week, last week, my speed was 0.4 meters per second. So this week I'm going to go up five pounds or 10 pounds, and I'm still going to try to hit 0.4 meters per second. Trend, main, same speed, higher weight. And sometimes I can do that. And sometimes you can't. And if you can't, it's not about getting depressed that you didn't make progress from week to week because there's still maybe fatigue left over. Again, life stress, unproductive stress, whatever those things are. But the, the key is that we get the right stress today to continue to drive the adaptation mm, so totally. that over the course of two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, that line still goes up and to the right, probably at a lower slope than it did when you were, you were a novice. But like that's still the goal. And if it doesn't, then we know that we can make changes that's the other thing. I think it gives you really good feedback quicker so that over a two week period, we can be like, hey, we probably need to make some adjustments. The coach should make some adjustments because we're not making progress over a two week period or three week period. But it's not about guaranteeing being faster, speedier, better every single workout or from workout comparison, you know, from bench workout to bench workout to bench workout. It's not always going to work that way because you're going to have days where you're stressed or you didn't sleep well or whatever. And you're just going to move the weight with intention. You're going to do the best you can. You're going to do the right amount of stress. And that's going to do the adaptation that you need. Had you done what had been programmed, if you were a little beat up, it would have been too much stress and probably driven you into a place that you didn't make progress at all. And so you really have to start to take the long game view. And um, and that's tough when you've come out of linear progression or PRs every single workout. There are not PRs every single workout. That's part of what's being part of being advanced is that you don't. And so so as long as you can keep that into perspective and go like, hey, I'm just moving it with intention. Over time, this is going to get better. You know, chalk up the slow days to slow days, rough days, high stress days, whatever, and move on and put it behind you. And that's, I think, one of the best things as advanced lifter can do. You know, back in the days when I used to play poker many years ago, 10 years ago, the best poker players get a bad hand. They get a bad, like bad beat, bad luck. And they forget about it two minutes afterwards, like mm-hmm. instantly afterwards. That doesn't change the way they play. And so training has to be the same for an advanced lifter. Get the bad workout, the tough workout, the stressful workout, the slow workout, the beat up workout. And it's just part of the long term process. Yeah. To me, the clients that do those workouts consistently are the ones that make the most progress because anybody can go in and train when they feel great and they feel fast and they feel explosive. And other people come, you know, you come in and you feel like crap and you do half the workout and you're just like, I shut it down because I feel like crap. No, no, no. Do the workout to the right amount of stress. Understand you did what you're supposed to do today. That's those blue collar days that I talk about punching that time card and come back in the, to fight another day in another couple of days. See how the speed is. And a couple of days after that, see how the speed is. And then what you'll see probably is you'll continue to see that slope move up into the right. It just won't be a beautiful linear line from workout one to workout 40. It's just not going to happen. So Yeah, that's okay. This guy is not falling. <laughs> that's right. So there you go. There's auto regulation. Yep. So great tool to have in your bag for advanced lifters, for coaches who are moving clients towards late, intermediate, and advanced. And uh, and so if you have questions, please send an email to podcast at barbelllogic.com, podcast at barbell-logic.com. And w- any questions you want to know about auto regulation, velocity-based training, RPE, RIR, coach's eye, bar speed, AMRAPs, anything in this auto regulation wheelhouse, please ask those questions over the next couple of weeks. We'll have Jordan back on the show and we'll come on and we'll do some Q&A uh, based on those questions and uh, and we'll, we'll answer those and help try to hone in a little bit on any questions that you have to help you get a better handle on this, whether that's for your own coaching or for your own training or if you're a coach and you're trying to utilize this or start to utilize this with a client. Again, I, I recommend the Rep1 device. It's a great device. They're hard to get a hold of. 
that I mean, it's another great, it, it shows how good they are is that they they're sold out all the time. So it's probably rep one.com. I don't know if you Google rep one, you can pull it up and then you can see, but again, we don't have any relationship with them. They've just done, a, we bought six of them a couple years ago and uh, they also have really a really good app that goes with it and tracks this stuff over time. They calculate your estimated one rep max based on your speed, the, you put in the ton, the load and this and the velocity, and then it, it'll kind of tell you what your they think your one one rep max. That's another fun game to play. As you warm up, you're at a certain weight, you move for a certain speed. It's like, oh, your estimated one rep max is this. And you're like, okay, I'm gonna drive that up on the next set. I'm gonna go a little faster. And so it's kind it's kind of fun. Yeah. Fun games to play. There you go. There's another episode of the Barbell Logic Podcast, Auto Regulation. Hope this brought you some value. If it did, please give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And uh, I'm excited because we're recording this. It's October 27th. It's almost Halloween. Halloween to me ushers in the holiday season. I don't know if you feel this way. I just went and spent like $600 on candy at Sam's because we <laughs> literally have 2,000 people come to our house. Oh, man. You guys, I need to have you guys out sometime <laughs> on Halloween. It is that would ridiculous. Wow. The first year... I spent a couple hundred bucks on candy and it was gone in like 20 minutes. We had to turn all the lights off. Jeez. I was like, what is going on here? That's when I would just start going to those neighborhoods. One of the neighborhoods yeah. where everybody comes by. And That's so fun. we get all the good candy and then we switch to the full size candy bars, the full size Snickers and stuff. You're that family. I'm that That's family. awesome. It's like mm -hmm. 730 when it starts getting dark and when slightly older kids come in. Look them up. <laughs> yeah, we make like Frito chili pie and I sit out on the porch with my wife and, and uh, just hand out candy. It's fun. So good. I love it. So. <laughs> Happy Halloween, everybody. <laughs> happy Halloween. Happy holidays. I'm excited. We go from like, you know, we go from bonfires and chili and candy to smoked turkeys and pecan pies. Obviously not not pumpkin pies, according to Scott, because he says those are gross. And then we go to eggnog and rib roast and yum. Fire nog. Fire I think nog. I'm going to do fire nog this year. <laughs> Burns both ways. Burns going down. Burns coming out. All right. Happy holidays, everybody. Thanks, we'll see everybody. you guys next week. <laughs>